let's talk about the 1835 Philadelphia general strike. Um, so, uh, I mentioned when I did the 1919 Seattle general strike, uh, that that was the first time something like that had ever been seen. And I, and I'll clear that up in, in, because you're, you're looking at it going, wait a minute, Chris, you talked about the 1919 Seattle general strike being the first time a general strike had ever been seen. And, and to that degree, I think that was true. I, I kind of had to reevaluate because that's a lot of the information that I was reading at the time was saying that the 1919 Seattle general strike was the first um, general strike that America had ever seen. And I think they're right in that it shut down the entire city of Seattle. Um, that was the first time that a general strike had brought everything to like a total halt, right? Like there was nobody out um, in the streets. The the only thing you could hear was the tide coming in and out. Everybody was kind of at home with their families, um, and then it and then because it because it had escalated to that level, um, the strikers themselves, the labor organizers themselves, um, decided to organize even further and create a community initiatives to take care of the people that. You know, might not have food or need milk delivered or garbage taken out. So, so the community came together um, and took care of those things, which is when, you know, uh, as sort of another r recap of, of that general strike is uh, that's whenever things, that's whenever the propaganda was, came in. That's when people started getting arrested just for, just for literally helping people take out their trash, just for literally feeding people. Um, this is sort of what the establishment does. This is sort of what the status quo that people crave so much does is that if, if any sort of um, any sort of real humanitarian cause that isn't approved or dictated by the government itself is is an arrestable offense. That's that's the society we live. That's status quo. That's what everybody is 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 clamoring for. That is. A, a different form of just authoritarianism. So um, the Philadelphia general strike, the 1835 Philadelphia general strike, is a little bit different than that. Um, so let's go through it. So this really starts in the 1820s. 1820s and, you know, into the 1830s. Uh, they, there were some strikes at that point. And uh, uh, what, what, the, what the strikes were really about at that point was to reduce the workday down to 10 hours. That's what it was about. Um, 600 carpenters in Philly, 600 carpenters in Boston, um, they all came together and they, uh, they ran a strike and uh, it failed. Um, they didn't get what they wanted. They were disbanded. Um, I'm assuming cops were called. That's usually how this sort of stuff works. If, if, if we've seen the pattern, uh, in these strikes, like the MLB strikes didn't have the authorities called on them, right? Like that, that one, um, the, the 1972 and 1994, it's like whenever, whenever the upper kind of the, the lower upper class strikes against the upper upper class, um, you know, the, the authorities aren't called, the military isn't used against them. Like, like the, the army wasn't called in to like blow up a fucking baseball stadium, uh, a ballpark to, to like show these baseball strikers who's boss. Usually for this, when it's blue collar workers, when it's white collar workers, when, when people from different, um, jobs are coming together, uh, that's whenever the cops, you know, and, and tanks are set up and it's like, we got machine guns. We're going to use the machine guns uh because these people like human rights are dangerous okay human rights could lead to less profits for us and that's scary that's scary so we have to kill these people like that's the way that it works <laughs> so um they had a couple of these strikes the strikes didn't didn't work they didn't get the 10-hour work day they were disbanded um so in 1835 the boston carpenters decided to go on a strike all together, right? The carpenters in Boston went to go on strike and they uh, penned a piece for the Boston Circular, which was a pretty big paper at the time. The Boston Circular was a pretty, pretty big paper. A lot of people read it. It was a pretty important paper at the time too. Um, so uh, they basically penned a letter uh, talking about uh, what, what they wanted, right? And, and here's, here's one of the things, I hope you guys can read this. 
here, here's one of the things that uh, uh, the the strike leaders said. Uh, he said, we have been too long subjected to the odious, cruel, unjust, and tyrannical system which compels the operative mechanic to exhaust his physical and mental powers. We have rights and duties to perform as American citizens and members of society which forbid us to dispose more than 10 hours for a day's work. Now, <clears throat> you can make that claim for today as well. Uh, we have an eight-hour workday rule, and let's say that you are an employer of some kind, um, and you know the, the the way that they've been getting around that is through part-time work. Uh, part-time workers only can work maybe six hours, but in order to be, but because you're part-time doesn't mean that you are uh, subject to terrible like worse and worse condi work conditions but and that's part of the thing right is because if you're part-time and you only work six hours for less pay than what you would work at eight hours at full time um and get benefits and all that sort of stuff you have to get two or three other jobs which means that you are working well past 10 hours a day you might be working 14 hours a day um, and only getting 10 hours to sleep and eat and have have recreational time and all this other stuff, uh, right? That's that's what's going on today. And in 1835, they were basically saying 10 hours is basically what you can do, right? Because because what what uh, this cat Seth Luther is talking about um, is talking about physical and mental powers being exhausted. And think of the worker today. How many of us work two, three jobs? How many of us work even just one job that's far more demanding, right? Teachers, teachers work one job, but I know a lot of teachers that have to take their work home with them and continue doing their work at home, right? That's kind of like, I, I think that's what homework really teaches you is, is homework teaches you that when you get home, you don't stop the job. You're off the clock. You're not getting paid for that labor, but you still have to get it done, right? It teaches you, like, that's what ed the education system really teaches you. It teaches you how to be a good little worker bee, just buzzing around making somebody else money. That's kind of what it teaches you to be. Um, and, you know, and I, and I do feel like worker bee might be an inaccurate uh, way to describe that because here's the thing. A worker bee serves a function, Um and it and isn't isn't worked to death like i'm pretty sure like bees are like you've you're good we got a different shift coming in just fucking chill out for a bit you know like move i don't know lick some honey or something i don't, I don't, I don't do a dance go go visit that flower you like just go hang out you're fine you know so maybe that's not the most accurate way but but it's but that's kind of what it is you you're supposed to take your work home with you um and do that work and get it completed off the clock um, instead of instead of kind of having a more relaxed attitude towards that work and saying um, hey why don't we why don't we give teachers an opportunity to take an hour and a half or two hours of the day within this within within the parameters of school itself uh, where they can do all their grading they can do extra lesson planning you know I know they get free periods and things of that sort but but that still isn't enough if they're taking that work home and they're, they, continue, they, they, continue, they have to continue to keep doing that. And I know tons of other people that have to do that, right? It's just not teachers. I'm using teachers as an example. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure some of you guys out there have jobs where you've had to take that job uh, home and have done it from home. Um, and, you know, like when you break it down, it doesn't really add up. So that's what these guys are fighting for. Uh, so they penned this letter, they talked about, you know, the physical exhaustion, the mental exhaustion, um, and then they organized a traveling committee to request the assistance of other cities. They basically were, were getting people together and sending them out to organize a, a strike of the same nature in other cities and saying, come join us in solidarity uh, in Boston, the, join, join the Boston Carpenters and, and have solidarity between us. <clears throat> now this did fail um the boston strike did not pan out once again they were disbanded i'm sure police force was used 
Um, there's very little detail in regards to that, in regards to how this stuff was uh, disbanded, but, it, but they were disbanded nonetheless, right? But um, it, because they had these organizing tr uh, travel committees that they had put together in Philadelphia, there were a bunch of carpenters that were like, hey, those Boston cats fucking, they got a point. We got, we should do this. And, uh, the, the, the guy that the, uh, that started with the carpenters in Philadelphia, um, and the guy that was in charge of, uh, of, of the, the, basically the carpenter union at the time. Right. He said that the Boston strike, the Boston strike showed them, uh, that they can, they can break their shackles, loosen their chains and made them free from the galling yoke of excessive labor. That fucking language is amazing, isn't it? That language is so good. Oh, that's some fucking fighting language right there. You know, that's a, that's like, that's the kind of poetry that when, when you hear it, you're like, yeah, man. Yeah, let's fucking, let's fucking change the system. You know, like that language is, is poetic. It's beautiful. It encapsulates so much, you know. And this is the sort of shit <laughs> that when you read this sort of shit, you're like, oh, my God, I'm so I'm like, I'm ready to fucking do this. I'm ready to rock and roll right now. You know, I'm ready to take to the streets, damn it. You know, it's like, Chris, where's the fucking organization happening? Where is it? Is it happening now? Let's do this. <laughs> you know? Like I read that this morning and I was just like, fuck, yeah, man. Broke the bro broke their shackles, loosened their chains and made them free from the galling yokes of excessive labor fuck i don't even know what a gallon yoke is but uh, but i don't think it's good you know i think we need to be free from these gallon yokes fuck these yokes you know but and it empowered a bunch of people <laughs> even in 1835 you know uh so 300 workers specifically that worked in the coal industry <clears throat> marched down the Schuylkill river coal wharf led by a worker who had a sword. That's right, this motherfucker rode down the Schuylkill River with a sword, <laughs> right? Just like bearing a sword, it's <laughs> ready to go. Uh, and then he threatened death on anyone that crossed the picket line. So if the bosses decided that they were gonna get some scabs to come in to do the job, to, to go work at the coal yard, well, that's not gonna happen because this motherfucker with a sword is is gonna it, it mince you up is gonna dice you up right that's like which is part of the thing that leads me to believe um that there was violence used in the in the 1820s and then in that even in that uh 1835 boston strike um it leads me to believe that there was probably some sort of violence used uh because this motherfucker like people don't just i i, I don't believe that that's not the pattern of human behavior that you just arbitrarily choose violence. It is the pattern of behavior um, when someone is uh, trying to protect or masquerade their guilt, is trying to use fear as a motive. As, as we've seen in virtually all these strikes, the bosses, the people at the top are scared. They're scared that they're going to lose money, they're going to lose investment, they're going to lose power. The power will go to the worker. The worker will be, you know, they'll democratize the workplace. And by democratizing the workplace, um, they make more money. They have more reason to actually do it. They feel more fulfilled at their job. They feel like they're serving a bigger purpose, which means that they will realize that these bosses uh, don't actually have much of a purpose. So they use that fear that, it, that internalize fear and then push it outward, which is where you see, you know, violent threats, which is where you see them calling for the army to come in and, and calling for police brutality. Even back in the 1800s, they were doing it. So I think this is sort of a protective measure to be like, we've seen these motherfuckers use violence before, so we're going to have a sword and I'm going to fucking be like, you won't cross this picket line, do you? Huh? I'm using a pen because it's technically stronger than a sword. Now, <laughs> that was just the coal, coal wharf workers, 300 of them. 
right? But they were like immediately after that joined by the leather dressers, printers, more carpenters, bricklayers, masons, house painters, bakers, and then city employees were joining them too. Um, and then on June 6th, 1835, there was a mass movement, mass movement of workers from all over the city, the entire city, um, and they organized together and they made a list of demands. So what was their list of demands? 10 hour workday, that's what we've been talking about this whole time, uh, right? 10 hour workday, uh, better pay for everybody, pay wage increases for everybody, including the women workers. They were, they, were, they were like talking about women's rights in 1835 because of this labor union, because of this labor strike, right? Boycotts of any boss who makes anybody work more than 10 hours. So, if, so at this point, you also have to remember um, overtime pay is like not a thing. They, that, that comes in almost, almost 100 years later. I'm sorry, rather, a little over 100 years later. 1938 is when they, when they uh, put, officially put overtime pay into play, right? So almost 100 years later, they come into it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they're talking about getting better pay for women. And they're talking about boycotting anybody that, that makes people work longer than 10 hours. Basically saying, we will, we will re-engage all of this shit. If you think you can just kind of say the words without seeing any sort of punishment behind it, you got another thing coming, okay? You know that motherfucker with a sword? We got 10 motherfuckers with a sword. And we got 20 with a fucking pen that are going to write you out. <laughs> We're going to write you out of history, motherfucker. <laughs> So um, that was on June 6th. Uh, by the end of this, by the end of the strike, uh, which only ended after city, city and public works employees joined the ranks of the, uh, of the 20,000 people in Philadelphia that had already uh, risen to the strike, the government caved. The city government finally was just like, okay, we've had enough, okay? I've been trying to make coffee by myself and I almost hit the building on fire. I don't know what I'm doing. What pans am I supposed to use? I'm so tired. I'm so tired. And they came, right? And on June 21st, 1835, a 10-hour workday was Im implemented citywide. The entire city was 10-hour workdays. You can't go beyond 10 hours. They got their wage increases, in including for women. Um, and, and they said that you can't go beyond this 10-hour fucking workday. You just can't do it. Right, so obviously a lot of the bosses were pissed off at this, but but what were they gonna do? You you got you got motherfuckers with a pen writing them out of history, and you got motherfuckers with a sword uh, carving them, you know, in, into history. But and here's here's sort of the, the amazing part about this victory, right? He, here's the thing: um, this news spread all across the country. Like the fact that the Philadelphia general strike worked. Um, it didn't shut the city down like the 1919 Seattle general strike did. It didn't shut down the whole city or anything, but it worked still, right? Um, this, it's, we saw this go all across the country, and then people were like, wait a minute, we can win? We can win? So New Jersey did it. That's right, fucking New Jersey did it, you guys. Like, if fucking New Jersey can make it happen, I'm pretty sure everybody can make it happen. Uh, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Connecticut, and by the end of 1835, the entire country, the entire country uh, in 1835 had a 10 hour workday. And, uh, and that's huge. That's huge, right? It's ironic to me that uh, th the victors are the ones that write the history. We've, we've all heard this adage before, uh, that the victors are the ones that write the history, but we won right here. Why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about the 1835 Philadelphia general strike that led to a countrywide shift in the labor movement? Why, aren't, what, why, why hasn't that been written into the history books? You know, um, we don't learn about this shit in school. We don't learn about this shit as part of our public education program. And that's, and that's done on purpose because they don't want you to organize. They want you to go home and do your homework find that answer that they told you to find, they told you was the right answer, and then recite it to us. Because what they want 
is good little workers. They want these drones that aren't going to question the authority, that aren't going to question the bosses, that aren't going to question city officials. They want they want to hide this sort of information so that you don't you don't realize that you can actually win. And how do we win? We win by staying in solidarity with each other. That's how we win. This is not only about um, what, like it, it wasn't only about the carpenters in Boston. It was about everybody. That's why they got the community together. And that, that might be something that we might have to put into effect at some point soon, is if we want a nationwide general strike, something that I, I don't think we've genuinely seen like a nationwide general strike before. If we really want to see something like that, we might have to, um, we might first of all have to implement this idea on two levels and go with me here because this is coming to me as like my brain is operating in the moment so you're seeing the, the gears turn in my head um first of all it's going to take someone you know so we, we're seeing amazon strikes whole food strikes mcdonald's pittsburgh sanitation we might see a healthcare strike i'm not sure but we're going to see strikes popping up all over the damn place and uh and what it might be is to go to you know Walmart or Target or, uh, it, you know, send a couple people to be like, hey, you guys should ask for a better hazard pay. You guys should ask for better safety equipment, you know. And when that happens, um, the Target strike is in solidarity with the Amazon strike. Now you have something going within the city itself, right? The community, those, those uh, what are they called? Community or uh, that organized traveling committee, the organized traveling committee, um, you do that on a local level, on a citywide level. <clears throat> so each city kind of can do that on its own. And then the second level is, let's say, you know, you hear like uh, Dothan, Alabama is not, uh, it, you know, the, the strikes aren't really moving in Dothan, Alabama. Now you can send that organizing committee over and be like, here's what we learned in Pittsburgh. Here's what we learned from you know uh rochester here, here here's what we learned in poughkeepsie uh, and put all that information and help doth in alabama bring that general strike to the forefront <clears throat> so i think that organizing traveling committee idea can really work on two different levels that would be that in my opinion would be quite successful i might be wrong i don't know and then we write that history we write the history of how we came together and fucking teach it to other kids we teach it to the next generation so that if if the powers that be, if at any point, if any sort of power that be decides that they're going to try to exploit people, decides that that's their point of intelligence, is exploiting the shit out of people and making money off of them and not giving, not giving them the basic human rights that they deserve, then we have, we have it right there in our history. We fucking use these. We fucking use this to, to show people how to win. <clears throat> They learn from it. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. My throat's really dry today. Um, but they, but they learn from it, right? The establishment, the the the, the bosses, uh, as you would. That's what we saw in 1919. If you go back and watch that video, you can pick up the little details of how they paid attention to how um, these organizers came together. And, and made a change for the betterment of the worker, that, that made a change to democratize the workplace a little bit more. <clears throat> and through that, they, you know, in, in 1919 in Seattle, they used, um, they, used, they used morale as a way to kind of put an end to the strike. And then eventually we countered that and said, no, you know what, our morale isn't going to go down because this is more than just about the labor leaders. This is just. This is more than about the union leaders. Um, this is about the community. So in Winnipeg, when it happened, they didn't go down, um, and then they resorted to violence, and then that ended the strike. Well, in San Francisco in 1934, that did not play out. Right, a hundred years later, the bigger tactics of um, d diminishing morale and using violence against strikers didn't work out. And, uh, and the 1934 San Francisco general strike was just as much a success as the 1835 Philadelphia general strike. Uh, because we learned. We learned what, what, what their tactics are. 
we learned what they're trying to do with it. Um, and, and by staying together, by being in solidarity with each other, we were able to win. And that's our key. Our key is that we don't let the violence, um, we don't let the violence discourage us. We don't let a couple people getting arrested uh, or the, the labor leaders getting arrested discourage us. We don't let Bernie Sanders not fucking being uh, on the offense towards fucking Joe Biden and, the, and, and all these establishment Democrats discourage us from pushing the movement forward and doing what needs to be done to get our rights back. That's what movements like this really show us. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and, uh, and if you, if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you, if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and um, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do, and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.